Part 1 You will hear a woman phoning the local council about an abandoned vehicle. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Environmental Health Department, Paul speaking. Oh, hello. Um... I wanted to report a vehicle that's been left parked near where I live. I think it's been abandoned. I wondered if the council could arrange to get it towed away. Have I got through to the right department? Yes, you have. If I could just take a few details. Your name, please. Mrs. Shefford. Thank you. It's not my vehicle, though. I just thought someone ought to report it. No, that's fine. What I need to do is take some details first... Then we can decide what to do about the problem. Oh, I see. So the next thing I need to know is your address. Right, it's 41 Lower Green Street. Yes. Barrowdale. And the postcode's WH45JP. Fine. And if I could just ask for a telephone number? It's 01778 55 Two three eight seven. I'm out quite a lot, but you can just leave a message on the answer phone if you need to. Or I could give you my mobile number. That's all right, don't worry. Now, could you tell me a little more about this vehicle? You say it's been abandoned. Well, it certainly looks like it. Can you give me an idea of where it is? Yes, it's near the main road that goes through Barrowdale. Is that the A69? Yes, that's right. Now, there's the primary school just towards the end of the village, and then next to that, next to the children's playground, there's a field, and it's in there. Oh. I wonder how it got in there. Well, there's a gate to allow farm machinery in and out. I, I thought something ought to be done about it. The children from the school might start playing in the vehicle and lock themselves in or something. Yes. You are quite right to report it. And what type of vehicle are we talking about here? It's a van, actually. You know, the sort with just a couple of little windows at the back. Right. You don't happen to know the make and model, do you? Oh, yes. I went and had a look and got all the details. I thought you might need them. I'm surprised the school hasn't contacted you about it. Anyway, I wrote the details down. Uh, right. It's a Katala, and the model's a Flyer 2000. Is that F-L-Y-E-R? That's right. Very good. And the colour? Well, it's not all that easy to see because it's absolutely filthy. And actually, it looks as if it's had a paint job at some stage. It's blue, but you can just see white underneath where it's been scratched. Right. Well, I'll just make a note of the present colour. And if you could just tell me the vehicle number. Did you make a note of that? Oh, yes. It's... S-322-G-E-C. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. A 
And it sounds as if the general condition of the vehicle isn't too good, from what you say. No, it's pretty poor. It wouldn't be drivable. It's got a flat tyre and there's a crack in the windscreen. I reckon someone just wanted to get rid of it. That's usually the way. It's been there for nearly a week. No, it must be eight days. I remember it was a Sunday morning when I noticed it. It wasn't there the day before. I walk past it most days on the way to the shops. I'd have thought the school would have reported it. Does the field actually belong to the school? No, it's part of Hill Farm Estate. Right. I'll just make a note of that. And I don't suppose you have any information about who might own the vehicle? No, I've no idea. So what will you do now? Well, we'll come and have a look and see if we can trace the owner. And if we can't, the vehicle will be removed as rapidly as the law permits. It could be anything up to 20 days. One thing I should say, I'm quite sure this doesn't belong to anyone round here. I definitely recognise it if it was from someone who lived here. So you don't think it was anyone local? Right. I'd say at a guess we're looking at a stolen vehicle here. I did wonder if it might have been. You hear such a lot about car thieves nowadays. Well, we certainly will be looking into that possibility. Anyway, thank you for contacting us, Mrs Shefford, and we'll keep you informed of what happens. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Starting at the beginning, you can see the on-off switch just beneath the two lights. Having turned the machine on, these lights now become very important. When the light on the left has gone out, you can begin making coffee, as it means the water is now hot enough. Next to that is the water level light. If this is illuminated, it means the machine does not have enough water. It is essential that you turn the machine off and add more water the moment this light comes on, otherwise you could damage the heating element. Once you have checked that both the heater light and the water level light are off, make sure the filter holder, that's the part with the handle just under the control panel, is in place. Once you have your cups ready, it is time to press the coffee delivery switch that's the button just above the filter holder beside the boiler meter. Remember to take a quick look at the meter as it tells you the exact temperature of the water. On both the left and right hand side of the machine, on the same level as the filter holder, you can see the steam pipes used for heating milk. These steam taps need to be cleaned regularly to avoid blocking. And finally, if you do spill any coffee, don't worry. Just make sure that the drainage pipe at the bottom of the machine is leading into a sink or a suitable waste container. As with the steam taps, the drainage pipe needs regular cleaning. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. First and most importantly, I'll tell you where you should go from tomorrow for your lectures and classes. The Health Sciences Building is on the west side of the campus, opposite the library, beside the History Department. As you are probably aware, there are six modules to the course, which will take a year to complete. That's two modules each term. In the first module of this term, you will be looking at current laws with regard to health and safety in the workplace. Don't forget that as you progress through the course, you should be building your thesis. This will need to be completed by the end of the year. Coursework will also be credited to your final grade, but the most important part of the course is the thesis. Now the final thing I want to tell you, and again you should know this, is that there will be a number of guest speakers throughout your course. They will come from a number of different medical backgrounds, but they will all be giving you their views on the relevance of health sciences in their occupations. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. You have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now, if for no other reason than it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. But we must press on, and I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird, the role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, 
feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. It was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices. To try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union. To take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba. Or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Four. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used 
so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you are away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them. And it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education, as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance. And from there, to send data directly to a computer so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And, of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.